Catalyst 2030 is a movement of social entrepreneurs and innovators embracing collective action to achieve the SDGs by the deadline 2030. Our 1,500 members are active in 197 countries. By emphasizing collaborations, Catalyst 2030 is leveraging the power of the collective to accelerate real change in the lives of billions of people around the globe. What do our members say about Catalyst? Catalyst 2030 is an invaluable global community of impact entrepreneurs. Our relationship with Catalyst 2030 has really taught us the power of co-creation. Join Catalyst 2030 and network bond and collaborate with our family members. And I like the spirit of bringing change makers together to share and learn from each other. Catalyst really understands the transformative nature of um, collaboration. It's also a platform that um, can give us um, new tools and resources. Catalyst 2030 has put my work on steroids. But most importantly, to come up with solutions that are practical, ways where we can really make things happen, because social entrepreneurs are doers. Are you a catalyst? Join us to achieve the SDGs. Welcome everyone, happy Thursday. On behalf of Catalyst 2030, we want to welcome you to this session on catalyzing funders to more effectively support systems changing social impact. I am Tim Hanstead. I'm your moderator today. I serve as the CEO of the Chandler Foundation and I'm a proud co-founder and board member at Catalyst 2030. I've spent most of my career on the doer side of the doer donor divide and that as the, as the co-founder and longtime leader at Landessa where I continue to serve as a board member. And it was my long experience as a fund seeker and as a grantee that shaped my perspective as to how the funding ecosystem for social innovation could be improved to better support systems changing efforts. And we at the Chandler Foundation are pleased today to be working with Catalyst 2030, with CoImpact, with RPA Shifting Systems Initiative and with other efforts to change funder mindsets and practices in tangible ways. I'm convinced that there's no single silver bullet that's gonna accomplish the needed change. Rather, it's gonna require multiple and varied efforts to help push, pull, and otherwise assist funders to take the many needed steps we all must take. And today we're gonna to learn about two such efforts from within Catalyst 2030. We will hear, we'll also hear from some funders about the steps they have been taking. Um, our hour today is gonna to be divided into three parts. First, we will hear from social innovators behind two specific initiatives within Catalyst 2030, an NGO called the Action Open Letter and the Funder Diagnostic Tool. Second, we're gonna hear from a few funders about steps they have taken to more effectively support systems changing social innovation. And finally, at the end, we're gonna spend about 10 minutes in Q&A and then wrap up. So in preparation for that uh, Q&A, please do send your, your questions in the chat um, as we go. I'd also encourage you to um, provide comments in the chat. These sessions are always more uh, engaging and, and fun and productive when we have a, a lively chat session. Um, I'm gonna introduce the, the speakers. I'm gonna start with the, introducing the speakers for just part one and later I'll introduce speakers for, for part two. The LinkedIn profiles for all of the speakers will be be put in the chat. So my, my intros are going to be very, very brief. So first, for part one of the session, our, we have three speakers. Uh, the speakers are Bradley Miles, who currently serves as Senior Advisor of Innovation at Panorama Global. Brad is also a recipient of the Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship, and he's worked for over 15 years in this field and is doing so many things right now to um, 
to help change the funding ecosystem from, from his perch at Panorama Global. We also are gonna have Karen Spencer. Karen is the founder and CEO of Whole Child International, also a founding member of Catalyst 2030 and a social entrepreneur. Karen's great and innovative work has led her to being awarded an Ashoko Fellow, and she's also recently joined the board at the Center for Global Development. Thanks, Karen, for joining us today. And finally, uh, uh, our third speaker for this first portion is Manmeet Mehta. Manmeet is a Director of Program and Operations and Impact at Ashoka. Again, uh, uh, Manmeet has more than 15 years of experience in the field in private and social sectors, leading work in designing and growing programs that build and deepen the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems. So, Thank you to, to our, our speakers for the first portion. And I'm gonna start by handing over to you, Brad. Sounds great, Tim, thank you. And thank you for your leadership in this space. And for everyone joining, we are thrilled to be in this session with you and to share this work and to uh, invite you to be part of this work. And so uh, Karen and Meet and I have all been working on this together along with this broader working group within Catalyst which is the Shifting the Funding Paradigm Working Group. And the, the background of this is when you talk to Catalyst members around the world, when you talk to social entrepreneurs around the world who are working on systems change, there's just this common refrain that people think that the funding ecosystem isn't quite enabling their work in the best way that it could. And there's still improvements to be made. There's, there's amazing innovation happening, but there's still improvements to be made globally. And so we've been brainstorming as a working group, what are all the things that social entrepreneurs can do to speak into this system. So there is the Embracing Complexity Report, there's the Funder Diagnostic Tool, which you'll hear more about. And at the end of the Catalyst three-year strategic review last December, we heard from social entrepreneurs around the world saying, we still feel like more needs to be done. We still feel like our voice can be heard. We're on the receiving end of philanthropy. We're proximate to the issue. We know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of these funder relationships. How do we speak into this? So the idea came of doing a global call to action letter, which builds on the principles of the Embracing Complexity Report. It builds on principles of trust-based philanthropy. A lot of the content of the letter you'll see is not entirely new. It's things that people in philanthropy have been working on for 10 or 20 years and points that have been made. But the unique thing here is it's an organizing effort to get the collective voice of social entrepreneurs around the world to say, we agree with these principles. These are the things that would really ideally empower our work on systems change and systems change innovation. So we did this whole co-creation process. You heard that in the, the video earlier, the, this, the writing of the letter was this elaborate process over four months of getting NGOs around the world to weigh in throughout the working group and throughout Catalyst. We arrived at these 10 principles. We arrived at some call to action pieces. This is speaking on behalf of the, the working group and the work of dozens of different groups. And then we started an organizing effort and it's a 10 week push from April, May and June to try to get hundreds or even thousands of signatures around the world from grassroots global, uh, grassroots global organizations, organizations from countries all over the world in Catalyst and, and other networks. So it's not just a Catalyst letter. So then now the letter's up on a, on a webpage so people could see who's already signed it. About 400 groups have signed so far. And uh, it's an organizing effort. It's a group project. It's, it's not owned by any one organization, but Catalyst is kind of a hub for this type of organizing. And we think that it's one more log on the fire. It's one more thing in this, in this global dialogue around changing the system to support system change entrepreneurs of this is the collective voice of social entrepreneurs saying, this is what we wish for. This is what would delight us. This is what would empower our work the best to have the most impact if these 10 principles were applied. So I uh, would love to share the letter with you all. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's open for everyone to, to share, to sign, to share with their networks. This is the power of the distributed network within Catalyst. So would love to uh, hear your questions and grateful to everybody who's worked on the letter and, and Karen and Manmeet and everyone in the working group and speaking with them. Um, we're excited about this letter and hopefully funders will uh, see it as a tool that they can use to continue uh, working on changing the system. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Karen, you are both the, the co-chair of this working group within Catalyst 2030 that's, that's about changing the funding ecosystem, but you're also a social entrepreneur. And 
Uh, you've signed the letter. Give us your perspectives on the letter and again, remind people what they can do and how they can uh, sign on to the letter. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting is that, um, you know, I think a couple of things really important for those people who are new to this. And one is that this really is the voice of the collective that is reflected in all of the things that you're hearing about. So the wonderful thing about Catalyst is that we have, I think it's almost 1500 members now from literally all over the world. Um, and this really is the collective voice of, of what is holding us back in terms of achieving our full potential as social entrepreneurs. And I think part of the reason why I'm so passionate about these principles and how important they are to our work is because I happen to be very privileged relative to most social entrepreneurs that I meet in my community. And I recognize that it's really only because of that that I have been able to do systemic work and really do the work that was needed, not just following where the funding would leave me, lead me, but really, really take a systems approach and develop over 18 years a really systemic, sustainable approach. But there's no way I could have done that without the access to unrestricted funding that I had, which was more than anybody could have hoped for. So it's why I'm so passionate about this. And I think the work that we've done in terms of turning that collective voice of the nitty gritty of what it is that would enable us to be more impactful, turning that Manmeet and, and Bradley and, um, and Gupreet uh, from Skoll, we've worked on this tool translating the voice of the community into an assess a funder self-assessment tool. And, and we hope that that's going to be helpful in terms of actually really drilling down on very specific behaviors. Because I think that sometimes, you know, the big concepts get trickier to apply for foundations. And the other thing that I think that's important to note, because we're sitting here with a lot of very influential funders, is that this shift is going to happen because of you and it is going to be the funders that are influential funders sharing with their community that taking this approach is more effective and i know that a lot of you i've been reading some powerful writings that you've been doing about this but i just really want to reiterate that that that's what's going to make the difference. We can do what we're good at, which is as social entrepreneurs, be disruptors and make lots of noise. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, this big shift is going to be funder led, I think, in order to be really as impactful as it needs to be. Thanks, Karen. Again, the link to the letter is in the chat. And I just want to underline one point here. While this is a letter from the NGO social entrepreneur community to funders. It also allows for funder allies to sign on to the letter. So if you are in this session and are a funder, uh, take a look at it because you have an opportunity to sign it as well as a funder ally. Karen, you mentioned uh, the, the funder diagnostic. And while we're looking at these two initiatives, I think it's really important to note that as you already have, that there's a link between the two. And there's also a link back to uh, an earlier initiative of Catalyst 2030, along with Ashoka and Co-Impact and many others who, who uh, developed uh, the Embracing Complexity Report and the principles on that. But shifting to that funder diagnostic tool, Manmeet, uh, tell us about it and tell us, um, particularly for the funders on the, on the call, what, uh, how can they use it and how might it help them? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just to build on what both, you know, all of LT and Brad and Karen, all of everyone has shared is that these are efforts that are emerging in collaboration and they are efforts that are emerging in collaboration between social entrepreneurs all over the world and funders. And when we talk about systems change, we're essentially talking about shifting narratives and shifting mindsets and shifting policy and structure and power. These things take time. And that's where the one of our very first collaborations, which we mentioned the Embracing Complexity Report emerged from. And from there emerged all of these subsequent collaborations saying, look, we are at a moment of deep urgency for so many reasons all over the world. 
And there is a lot of good intention. A lot of funders are saying, look, we want to support this work, but there's a gap between translating that and operationalizing that. And that's where the tool comes in uh, as one of the ways in which we can unpack these large principles and say, what does it look like? And we've, we've organized it as uh, an invitation to reflect. It's, it's a diagnostic. It's, it's fairly simple. We've, well, we've tried to keep it fairly simple. Um, it looks at our the internal culture within the organization, how we think about success, how we think about failure, uh, what we think about trust and who's making decisions, how that shows up in strategy, and then subsequently how that shows up in grant making practice, because we think these are mutually reinforcing components. Um, and, and all of this needs to support um, be supported with the other component in order to actually create shifts that last um, and that help us accelerate this work. And so the diagnostic is we, we worked with, it builds on a lot of literature, it builds on a lot of expertise in the sector, a lot of work that's been done via research, uh, you know, the report that Tim, you mentioned, uh, other uh, groups, the scaling systems group, um, and draws on a lot of effort and saying, look, how can we, these are, these are opinions on what has worked. And so what, what do we need to do? And the idea is at the, at the end of this quick uh, self-reflection piece, we get to a set of recommendations, um, which provoke questions on where as funders, where are we and where do we, when I say we, Ashoka is not a funder, but where, where are you in your journey? And uh, where do you wanna be? And with very practical in, invitations to explore on how you can get there. I'm trying to be very quick. Can I, can, I also, can I jump in with one added little bit, which is that we're also constantly innovating and reiterating. So um, I'm sure we've missed important elements in our assessment, and it's entirely possible for sure you are all doing other things that are innovative in an attempt to be good funders for funding systems change, and we welcome any insights. So I'll put my email in the chat. Um, but please do email us if you take the assessment and you say, oh, we've missed this thing or we do this cool thing that we think is really powerful with our grantees in terms of shifting the power dynamics or any element of this. So um, please do reach out because we very much value and, and, and want feedback. Great. And what I love about both of these initiatives, both the uh, the letter and the, and the diagnostic tool is that these are such important steps to going beyond just rhetoric and to, to action. Um, there is, I think, increasing recognition from a low base within the funder community that uh, about the importance of funding systems changing social innovation and it's almost become part of the zeitgeist now that we, we we should be doing a better job. But the question is how and what practical steps are, are needed. And both the letter in its kind of detail uh, and, and length, and then of course the diagnostic tool really point to those uh, specific steps that, that can be taken. Um, Great, thank you, uh, Brad, Karen, Manmeet, for that. And we're going to come back to you with with questions uh, at the at the end of the session. But let's transition now to hear from the the funders. We have three uh, funder representatives on the call today who have agreed to talk about efforts that they have been taking. Um, to effectively support systems change. And I'm gonna in introduce all three at once and then ask them to speak in turn. Um, so we have Fernanda Drummond, who's a strategy leader at H&M Foundation. And prior to this role, Fernanda was head of operations at Gapminder. So thank you for joining us today. Again, I, I'm just making very brief uh, descriptions or introductions in the chat, you should be able to find the, the LinkedIn um, profiles of, of each. We also have Lewis, Lewis Borston, the Managing Director at Osprey Foundation. Uh, 
prior to his role at the Osprey Foundation, he was deputy director of, of water sanitation and hygiene at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's, he has a, has a long career also before that at IFC, as I recall. I don't have those notes in front of me. I'm just doing it based on, based on recall, Lewis, but um, thanks, Lewis, for, for joining. And then we have Kathy Rich from the Ford Foundation. Kathy directs the uh, BUILD program at the Ford Foundation. She's been doing that for the last six years. She's a seasoned philanthropy executive. Um, and the, the BUILD program in particular, which I, she's gonna share a bit more about is, is a really an innovative initiative within, within Ford. So let me start uh, with you, Fernanda. Um, you, describe yourselves at the h and Foundation as being impatient visionaries whose goal is to, quote, never settle, challenge, yes. comfortable, and look outside the box for new ways to help realize the SDGs by 2030. And that aligns so well with the, the ethos of Catalyst 20, 2030. So I know that you recognize that established systems and uh, uh, need to radically change and require a systems change approach. Can you share with us how how you at the H and M Foundation are working on systems change? Thank you very much for the question. Yes, I can definitely show you that. And in fact, I'm going to show you for real on my screen like this. So I have now uh, shared. I'm now sharing my screen, and I hope you all can see it. If you don't, please shout out. I speak fast when I'm excited, so listen faster. <laughs> At the H&M Foundation, as you mentioned, team, we are impatient visionaries using collaboration, remember this word, and innovation to co-create, important word as well, fund and share solutions for the world's most urgent challenges. And this may not seem so new, considering this, you know, amazing audience we have here, but it is uh, the, our strategy that tackles, I would say, systems changes very new um, and innovative, we have been working in the development uh, sector, let's say, for over a decade. And with our experience uh, pr prior to this new strategy, we realized that we were unfortunately working in silos. We were funding these beautiful hand washing stations and beautiful toilets and, you know, amazing programs and right next to it, we could see, for, for instance, that there was a school that had, you know, barely uh, any infrastructure to, you know, uh, accommodate children or the children have no, had no material or the teachers were almost never there. So we realized that it's not enough. We were too impatient to wait for change to happen by only working on bilateral uh, agreements on only having like the silo approach. So we decided to change now our strategy. It's been a few years already that we want to accelerate development for inclusive societies and catalyze the fashion industry to become planet positive. I'm going to talk a bit about this inclusive society part because we, what we want is to create a fair and inclusive world. How do we do that? That's the question. We need to first understand the system of inequality that creates uh, marginalization of some people. And then to do that, we need to identify what problems create and perpetuate inequality in this system. Um, I don't know if you see there, but it's written that we want to understand the root causes. It's only through understanding the root causes that we can change the system. Uh, how do we change the system then? We are just this one small, funder, small foundation, and we have not expertise in everything in the world. So what we do is we create, co we create an ecosystem with a multitude of different partners with different expertises who, who are local organizations at most, and they work to equip the primary actors. These are the, let's say, the beneficiary of our uh, uh, programs, but we don't like that word beneficiaries or target group because the primary actors are always included um, in the development and the implementation of these actions. So they are the primary actors. The primary actors 
are equipped to shift the power relations so they have agency to decide upon their own lives. We want with this uh, approach to bring equity. We want to create the conditions that are needed for us to reach equality. There you go. So this is in a nutshell how we are working and uh, we are creating these ecosystems for systems change. We work on a minimum of six years partnerships with cross-sector partnerships with partner partners from academia, from businesses, social businesses, from NGOs, from traditional systems, public agencies, everyone who should be involved is involved and the general public as well apart from the primary actors because we want to shift perceptions as well right so we want to provide a holistic support we have identified and selected this method called collective impact uh, that uh, for through, to, in which we work with our partners this collective impact method uh, requires us to have a common agenda for all the partners, shared measurement system, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, very important communication all the time among themselves, and a neutral local backbone organization who not only coordinates all the partnerships, but also leads the initiative. How we are funding systems change then in a more practical term. We're building these ecosystems with this, all these different stakeholders from different uh, sectors, as I mentioned. We are creating channels for sharing learnings, uh, structured and formalized uh, learning sessions that happen very regularly among other partners. We are more flexible uh, with and have simplified funding and reporting requirements, and we fund gender equality and social inclusion specialists or resources ask them to add resources and learning sessions for GESI for all the partners and we fund all the monitoring evaluation and learning activities i will not have time to dig into you know, details of all of our projects but we have these two beautiful collective impact initiatives one is in india samuhika shakti which means collective strength that seeks to its seven speakers to have greater agency to lead secure and dignified lives in bengaluru india and future of work initiative in bangladesh we are uh, we have about 11 partners we're welcoming 11 partners now to equip female government workers for an automated and digitalized future. And just to finish, we constantly use the system change funders self-assessment tool to, to make sure that we are following exactly these principles here. So we definitely motivate and you know uh, support everyone to use this tool as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernanda. That that was uh, that was a great overview and very impressive work. Um, and I should have mentioned also at the beginning that that all three of the foundations represented here are are members of the Catalyst 2030 donor learning group that that meets monthly. And um, so and moving to to Lewis, Lewis. Uh, you recently presented to the donor learning group and so we know from that that in your your wash work at the osprey foundation you have taken a systems approach and, and i've heard you emphasize that all funders including small funders can benefit from taking this approach you're you're a real evangelist of the approach can you tell us what are the fund kind of the foundational elements of of your systems um, approach and and what do you see as the, as the benefits and and the challenges of the approach sure thanks tim um happy to do that um try to be brief here so we have time for q a um so first i guess the two things why and how why do we take a systems change approach in our grant making we take a systems change approach because the sectors we work in which include water sanitation and hygiene clean energy uh, cleaner cooking um the only way we know effectively to get out of that business is to develop local systems um, that are strong and resilient and mean that once we've helped engage, we can get out of the way. Um, and, and in particular, 
Um, the way we define success in these local systems is that uh, the basic services such as water, sanitation, and hygiene um, are being provided to, to poor households um, in a way that uh, is safe, um, is uh, sustainable, um, and uh, reaches a lot of people. Um, that's our definition of success. And the reason we support systems change is we don't know any other way to get people sustainable services at scale if you're not building the systems. Um, so to that end, uh, we have a number of tools for doing this, but let me just name three of them. Um, first, um, we support a hub organization uh, in the water sanitation hygiene sector called the Wash Agenda for Change. Currently has 14 members in it. Um, this is an organization that gathers best practice, shares um, those approaches amongst its members. Um, its focus is on country-based collaborations. Uh, it has eight of them that it's currently supporting, uh, plus in a number of other countries, uh, the work is going on. Uh, those collaborations include the government, um, civil society, the private sector, uh, obviously communities, um, and, and the, the NGOs that, that, that are part of the, the effort. Um, so um, that is an a lot of what we do might seem unusual for a small foundation, um, but um, we, we like supporting that, that hub. It, it is a little strange in the sense that um, a lot of small foundations wanna see direct impact and we don't see direct impact out of that. We're well aware of that. On the other hand, we like to think that we're getting terrific leverage uh, because we're supporting the 14 organizations and all the work they do with dozens of governments around the world and households and communities. Second tool we use is um, we work with organizations that we think are well aligned on systems change. Systems change is basically part of the DNA of how they operate. Um, they'll work on a district wide basis um, in the, the countries where they work and work with the, the governments at the district level and at the national level. And um, for those organizations who we've known for some time and work with, we provide them with flexible funding because we know that most of the money they get doesn't support that. It's generally bilateral funding. Um, that has to, to show particular outcomes. And what they really need is flexible funding that allows them to learn and to innovate. And the third approach we use with some of our larger uh, grantees, and these can be organizations that have up to $100 million budgets a year or more, is um, some of these organizations have very good practice in certain parts of the world, but perhaps not everywhere. And so in those, we have what I might call an insurgent uh, approach, where we tend to, uh, where we fund uh, internal uh, advocacy and learning groups, um, generally at the headquarters of those organizations, uh, those groups, uh, the, the central units will engage with all of the country programs in the organization. And again, um, we're not providing them with a huge amount of money on the order of 100,000 or $200,000 a year, but the leverage that we get and the influence that those insurgent uh, units have within their organizations can really be profound. So three examples of how we do it and why we do it. Thanks. Thanks, Lewis. Um, and thanks for to all the speakers for being so so brief because I know what these uh, these initiatives are exciting and it's and there's so much detail to them. But and we're going to get to more of those details, I'm sure, in the questions. Um, transitioning to you, Kathy. Um, you lead the BUILD program. I, I remember when I first learned about the BUILD program probably six plus years ago. And at that time at Landest, I was at Landest and I thought, this is fabulous. I mean, I, this is just the type of thing that I wish more funders were, were doing. That, that program, I think actually led, um, helped, helped lead the Ford Foundation to get a Catalyst Award last year, a donor award um, for, quote, leading long overdue change across the, the philanthropic world by trusting social entrepreneurs. So congrats on that, that award. Can you describe to us, Kathy, what, the, what are the key elements of the BUILD program? Why, why did Ford uh, undertake the program? What, what have been the benefits? What have been the challenges? Sure, I'm happy to do that. And I know I'm standing between us and questions. So I will also try to be really brief. I'd like to start with the why first. And I think the why is if you are engaged in the work of systems change, as all of us on this call are, 
you realize that you are not going to make progress in a day, a month, a year, or even a decade. These are multi-year, often multi-decade challenges that we are trying to address. And a focus on short-term impact and short-term results is simply not going to get us there. What is going to get us to long-term systems change, whether we are talking about political or social or economic inequality or climate change, what's gonna get us there are a few things. Um, from a funder's perspective, it's going to take a deep humility, seeing ourselves as actors within the systems, not somehow sitting outside of them or able to control them. I think in philanthropy, we often want to be the drivers of change. And I'd argue that we need to see ourselves instead as enablers of change. Second, you need a commitment to deep partnership, right? You need a commitment to power sharing and power seeding with those whose voices have been least heard. Third, you need a rigorous commitment to questioning and to learning. Data and measurement do matter because they help inform your questions and contribute to your learning, but it's a question of how you use them, of course. Fourth, you need a willingness to fail and try again, get up, brush yourself off, keep working at it, keep iterating, keep coming up with new and different solutions. And then finally, you need a lot of patience. You do need long time horizons. And all of those factors argue for a fundamentally different approach to funding than what most foundations have embraced over the years. You need, all of these factors argue for significant multi-year flexible funding that empowers change makers to lead. And they argue for a stance of support and accompaniment by donors, not attempts to control. And that's what Ford tries to do in the BUILD program. We make five-year commitments. They are a combination of unrestricted support and what we call core support for institutional strengthening, still very flexible, but allows the NGOs receiving this funding to plan and budget and vision for their own futures in the ways that they see best. And the unrestricted funding allows uh, NGO institutions and networks to invest in all of the difficult process work that we know goes into systems change, the connecting, the strategizing, the systems mapping, all of those things that funders don't want to fund. There are a lot of other bells and whistles around BUILD. I'm happy to explain them to people if folks are interested, um, but, uh, but I think those are really the key points about the program. I wanna say none of this is rocket science. Some funders have been operating in this way for a very long time, long before Ford got on the bandwagon. Um, and, uh, and it is not hard either once you get started. So always happy to talk to funders who are interested um, in pursuing these types of approaches. Great, wonderful, Kathy, and thank you for that, that offer to talk to, to other funders. Um, well, thank you to all the speakers for being, uh, being brief again. You've left us more time for, for questions, and we're going to transition into that portion of our hour now. So there have been some questions that have come in through the chat. I encourage um, all the attendees to, uh, again, engage with the chat with your questions or comments or, or raise your hand. Um, you we can also do it that way. Um, and Lewis, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanna pick up on something Kathy just said that it's not hard to do it this way. Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, yes, it's not hard to do it this way if, if you've got a long-term perspective and you understand the, the folks you're working with. Uh, but no, it is hard to do it this way if you're a more traditional funder, you're looking for attribution from the sort of funds you're putting out there instead of looking at the contribution that you're, the, the organizations that you're funding are making to the, to the local system. So um, it does change, it does require a change of mindset on the part of the funder. Um, and um, there are ways, you know, there, there are great reasons uh, that I think have been outlined here for doing it, it all makes sense, but it is a change for a lot of funders. It's, it's a good point, uh, Lewis, and the, again, your, your mention of mindset change, like, uh, again, reminds me of our, our framework of the six conditions for systems change with mindset change being kind of 
the foundational implicit change that's, that, that's necessary. Um, we have, I'm going to group a couple of questions, and both of them were directed to you, Fernando. Um, one from Jamie Drummond, uh, who asked, what is being measured under your shared measuring? Um, and then the second one from Leah Bridgespan, who asks, um, how do you find and support the, the backbone? And what if there isn't an honest broker in the field that you're investing in? Fernanda, can you take those? I was disconnected for a minute. Do you mind repeating? Sure. I think you asked the question exactly as I was refreshing. <laughs> so, so sorry. So the two, two quick questions. One is, um, what is being measured under the quote, shared measuring end quote? And then yeah. how do you find and support the, the backbone? And what if there isn't an honest broker in the field that you're investing in? Actually, that's three questions. These are amazing questions, yes. Let's start with how do you find a support a backbone? So the backbone organization um, is to be a neutral um, organization that already acts in, this, uh, in, in the country where the activities are being made. So the neutral organization should not have any financial relationship with any of the other implementing partners. Um, and it's, uh, of course, the, the, the backbone organization is supposed to lead the, uh, the whole collective impact initiative. So they have to be experienced in the field and um, they can get experienced people, staff to work in the organization, uh, for example, with funds from funders who, who fund systems change. So um, it's, it's very important to build a good team an experienced team in this backbone organization. How do you find that? Well, I am going to quote Kathy here, saying that you pretty much have to try. You have pretty much have to, you know, put yourself out there, go risk yourself and uh, trust the relationships you're building. Um, in our case, we counted with the support of a consultancy firm called FSG, the, the thought leaders of collective impact in the world world to help us identify which organizations would be good backbone organizations in India and in Bangladesh, for instance. But I would say that, well, it's a matter of uh, building a relationship with an organization. You have a difficult question. What if there isn't a honest broker in the field you're investing in? I would say that you can most probably try to uh, work build a backbone organization that doesn't usually take this exact uh, role, but this organization can learn how to be a backbone organization. So you can bring an organization from another sector, I would say, so that they can learn and equip themselves and learn themselves how to become uh, a coordinating and leading organization for a collective impact. Lastly, what is being measured under shared measuring? Well, this is the macro, ma macro level indicators of where the initiative is going. So pretty much whether uh, the primary actors are receiving the agency, are being able to exercise the agency to uh, lead their own lives. So these are micro, macro, not micro, no, macro level indicators that uh, they, all the activities are from all the other implementing partners are going to contribute to. So for instance, number of primary actors reached or uh, measuring perception change among themselves, among the general public uh, and other activities that they usually receive. I'm trying to be brief here to leave a chance for my colleagues to answer. I hope this answered your question. Yeah, thank you, Fernanda. There's a question here for Lewis. Uh, can you say more about what the insurgent approach is designed to do in terms of internal advocacy? I responded to that in the chat. So maybe we can um, move on to, there are a bunch of other questions. You're so efficient, Lewis, thank you. Doing my uh, best. Um, Dato from Siegel Family Foundation has a question. Dato, do you want to come off mute to ask your question? It's 
data still out there? Well, okay, I'll read it. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh. Um, my question was particularly around, well, first of all, thank you very much for all your contribution. I feel like we are preaching to the choir here. Everyone is values aligned. Um, I'm saying this in order to um, gather my question. My question was particularly around collaboration. One of the things that we hear, well, I'm Dedo from Single Family Foundation. We fund uh, over 300 uh, nonprofit and social enterprises across Africa. And our goal is to be in the next couple of years, a marketplace where um, entrepreneurs are found, where we don't have the excuse of, oh, we don't know where they are. We don't know where the brokers are. We're investing along that whole value chain. So my question is particularly around collaboration. We hear often uh, partners on the ground saying how donors are really forcing sometimes collaboration, but uh, we don't see a lot of collaboration from funders except you know, sharing notes and, uh, and due diligence here and there. I was curious from the, our panelists today, some of the really bold uh, collaboration uh, opportunities that you have been involved in or that you think will be catalytic in pushing this agenda. Can speakers? I won't direct it at anyone. You just jump in. Go ahead, Louis. You raise your hand. So just one example, Dato, thanks for the question, is um, uh, we helped found a group of funders in the water sanitation and hygiene sector. There were six of us that met for about four or five years informally. And then in 2019, we decided to see if there were others who were interested. We have just added three more, and we now have 25 or 26 funders. Um, who meet regularly, um, exchange notes. Um, I've given a couple of presentations on systems change. Uh, there are presentations regularly given by other members. We bring in outside speakers. We have a half-time uh, coordinator who we fund. It's five or $10,000 per funder per year. It's very good value for money. We have a database where everybody has, has what's in their, uh, their uh, existing portfolio as well as their pipeline. It provides an opportunity for us to talk to each other. We've even had situations where if one of us couldn't get to a potential grantee or investee, um, we relied on the other's due diligence. Um, so um, there are a lot of ways to do this work, but um, that one's working particularly well. If I could just jump in as well, I, I really appreciate, Lewis, your description of, of that collaboration. And it does sound like really good value for money. And at the same time, we've seen enormous proliferation, excuse me, of, uh, of funder collaboratives, particularly in the last five years. And, and Bridgespan, I know we've got someone from Bridgespan on the call, has done a really go good job of documenting this explosive growth. I think it's mostly a very positive thing. Funders clearly need to collaborate more with each other. And yet there are drawbacks to it too. And one of the things that I worry about is that so there has been such a rapid growth that we risk duplication of effort and we risk creating a whole new infrastructure to feed within the nonprofit philanthropic infrastructure. So for those who are considering, for funders who are considering um, embarking upon collaborations, before you start a new one, I would encourage you to look diligently at what's already out there See if there's one like Lewis's WASH funders that you can join and learn from. And for NGOs, um, as we all know, some collaboratives are better to work with than others. Some create more bureaucracy for you, more distance for you from donors. Please be sure that your donors know who the great collaborative actors are. And if you feel comfortable and safe with that funder, please tell them where you have not had great experiences because we need to know that too. Great, Karen, good advice. Um, there's a question there from Jack Foreman. Jack, do you want to go off mute to ask the question yourself? Yes. Uh, okay. Sorry, it wasn't allowing me. Yeah, I wanted to ask about exit strategies because I see a lot of investors um, come in. I see a lot of uh, impact entrepreneurs or impact entrepreneurs, social enterprise entrepreneurs uh, come in and think they're going to make a million dollars, particularly in, I've seen it a lot in Africa. 
Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think what the exit strategy is. I assume you have to have a lot more patience than typical uh, investors, but is it, what is that? Is the typical impact investor walk in and say, hey, I wanna make, I'm gonna turn this over and this company's gonna go public? Or do they walk in and say, I'm gonna sell this to another company? Um, what is the perspective? <laughs> Who wants to take that one on? Well, we're impact investors as well as grant makers. And I can tell you that we tend to invest in very early stage, uh, quite high risk organizations that we think have very high potential for social and environmental benefit. Uh, when we do that, we go in with our eyes open and we are well aware that uh, it's a long-term investment. Sometimes we even make grants to organizations that other people are putting impact funding in. And when we put our impact funding in, we have a very honest discussion internally about um, what that takes um, to, to, to really make a difference. Um, it, it, yes, I mean, we're, we're, it, that's a long-term process. And I think if there are impact investors who are expecting to, um, to exit quickly or, or, or public exit strategies, I think they, maybe they're in a very different part of the market than we're in. Right. So what's the, what's the liquidity event that you're looking for? Oh, Does typically, it impact we're investors? Not, typically, right. typically we're not looking for a liquidity event. If we get one, that's great. Um, but um, we're much more interested in the models, the, 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 the service delivery models and other things. Um, well, I mean, I, we funded an organization called Sanergy in Nairobi that does, sure. um, and, and I was on their board and was the chair of their board. We, we, we provide funding, we provide time, advice, um, and we're much more interested in the long-term social impact um, than otherwise. Right, so they've done very well. I just wonder, do you ever have the intention of seeing your money back? In which case, if not, then you're in effect donors, right? That can happen. Excuse me just for a second. Tim, give the floor to someone else. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Gabriella. Gabriella, do you want to come off mute to ask the question? Hi. She says, <laughs> hey, perfect. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, so my question was really on sort of US funders have to demonstrate impact to some extent to your trustees and everyone. So in this forum, it's really easy for everyone to understand why systems change is the best approach. But how do you demonstrate that internally to your trustees when you're not going to be able to see you know, what the what the actual impact of your work is, because that's probably going to be over a few generations. It's not going to be like building a school. OK, it's there. You know, it's very it's a lot more complex. So how do you change that internally? How do you convince basically people and uh, who are going to be the decision makers on where the, the foundation is going to go? I can start with that and then I would love to hear what what others think, um, including folks like Manmeet and, and Bradley and, and Karen as well. Um, I think this is where a mindset shift comes in. I think that uh, trustees, uh, CEOs, and others who uh, are in decision-making roles do the field a great disservice if all they are doing is counting people served or people reached through a training or schools built or wells dug. Because as we all know, that is not, that does not, in add up to impact or change over the long term, right? I think instead what we need to look at are systems level indicators, right? Not just the huge macro indicators about is lifespan increasing, um, our, our, uh, whatever type of outcome you were looking for, is, is global amount of CO2 being emitted into the atmosphere staying at controlled levels. You need to look at process indicators that might indicate that you are starting to move the needle in the right direction. Um, do you have uh, thriving civil society ecosystems in a region that can advocate for these kinds of changes? What does thriving look like? 
What are those indicators look like? You need to really build back and help the decision makers understand that we are not working in a business environment. We are not going to be showing returns in an 18 month period. We are going to be building blocks for successes that we may not even live to see, right? But the story I always tell that, that helps um, the more business-minded uh, understand is the story of microfinance, right? Where it took 40 years before microfinance had what business would consider to be a viable ROI. 40 years of philanthropic investment, of hard, hard work and visioning by NGOs on the ground, no business would have stuck with it for 40 years. The only thing that I, Kathy, thank you for that point. The only thing that I, I would add in, um, Gabriella, to your question, is part of the motivation behind the group letter was also to speak to those boards of trustees so that if there's a program officer who's trying to make a case to a board of trustees, or if there's a director of a program trying to make a case to a board of trustees and the board of trustees isn't budging for whatever reason, maybe because they, they don't believe the impact is having quick enough or they, they don't see the attribution quick enough. We thought that this is the group thinking. If, that, if there was ability to say, well, you know, 2000 NGOs just signed on this letter and so-and-so signed it and so-and-so signed it, that might be persuasive to the trustees if they respect those organizations who signed it. And they'll be like, wow, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. So it's trying to speak to that mind shift, mindset shift. And to Tim's point, there's not gonna be one silver bullet. Not, you know, some people will be convinced by data, some people will be convinced by affiliation, some people will be convinced by uh, a group process. We just thought the letter would be one more tool in the toolbox of people trying to advocate for different mindsets and boards of trustees to say, well, all these great NGOs around the world think this, we should at least take this seriously. And there's power in that collective uh, voice to give those program officers that additional talking point when they're having those conversations with those trustees around that mindset shift. A bit of peer pressure. A bit, yeah. Like, mo like mobilized, distributed, <laughs> And with the power dynamic, I don't think any one NGO wants to be the one NGO saying, hey, funders, you need to change. You know, you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you. So there is that power dynamic, but there's kind of safety in the herd. And so when a thousand NGOs are saying it, um, maybe people feel more comfortable saying it because they're not the only ones sticking their neck out that might um, upset a funder. Um, if you're saying what you're saying, we didn't, we're not doing things the way you like, you know, so the, the letter has that power dynamic in mind as well. If I could just take one minute to add one more thought to that, which is that anecdotally, when we were doing the awards last year, and one of the things measuring funders that had been nominated against these practices, one of the things anecdotally, and there are outliers in this that don't fall to this um, pattern, the smaller, and medium-sized foundations were better in terms of practices, and the big guys were the um, least adopting of these things. And I noticed a, a comment up here about the philanthropy infrastructure industrial complex. And I do think that there's an element here that is up for discussion because a lot of the machine that has been built by big foundations to operate in this way becomes to a certain degree redundant in this new um, approach. Yeah. And I think it's just, you know, something that will need to be addressed at some point. Tim, can I jump in quickly or are we out of time? I, I think we're out of time. Sorry, Lewis. And with extreme apologies to well, all- I'll hang on. I will hang on after the end of some, I, I have a bunch of stuff to say it was a great question. So if others, I'll, I'll okay. hang on for about five minutes we, after the we end. Can keep, we can keep it open, I think, for those who uh, can stay, but because there are other catalysts, I think session starting at the top of the hour, we wanna finish on time. I'm gonna give the last word uh, to Mon Mead. Um, <laughs> to at the very least tell us again about the donor, the, the diagnostic. We had some people coming on late. So uh, so much of what has been talked about actually relates in some ways to the diagnostic. Before I give it to you, Manmi, I want to again encourage everyone who hasn't signed the ladder, take a look at it. It's in the chat. Uh, look at it, please sign it. Manmi, last word. 
Um, yeah, just really quickly, thanks, Tim. Um, I'm just going to underline um, and, and try and summarize these things. Like the mindset shift uh, is is key to shifting grant making practices, and that's where the tool emerges. Is on the experiences of social entrepreneurs and funders on what it takes to actually effectively fund this sort of long term sustainable transformative impact. Um, and, you know, and I think Karen, you just mentioned this and it, it, it's been mentioned in the chat, role modeling is really important and there are, there are visionary foundations, small, big, that have taken efforts. And, and, and I think that's how shift happens is it happens slowly. Um, but what, what you're doing to make that shift happen is a huge, um, it can be a huge catalyst to fuel this movement further. And that's just so critical and so timely. Thank you, Manmeet. And thank you to all of the speakers. This was a great discussion. Thank you for what you're doing to make changes in this important ecosystem. And thanks to all the attendees. Um, Lewis agreed to stay on. And I'm assuming, um, I guess I should ask the, uh, those, um, Mel and Matt, whether we can keep this open beyond time. I'm, I can stay on for a few minutes later, um, but I wanna give everyone permission to leave because uh, we, we'd only scheduled it for an hour. So I'm gonna say goodbye to all of those who, who need to leave. And I'm assuming that others of our speakers may need to leave, um, but at least Lewis is gonna hang on for a few more minutes uh, to, to answer questions. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you.